Thank you, Ruben, for having me. We're running a little over time, and some of these slides you've seen several times, so I'm not going to try to repeat them in any detail, but try to emphasize new information. So these are my uh, disclosures. Uh, this first case is a 76-year-old white female who presented two years ago with severe mid-back pain, a hemoglobin of 10. She had an elevated IgG with an M protein that was 2.62. She had some urinary paraprotein. She had a ISS stage 2 with an elevated beta 2M and decreased albumin or creatinine was mildly elevated. The bone marrow showed 40% plasma cells and the bone survey showed a lot of lytic lesions with a T10 vertebral compression fractures. So her initial therapy consisted of a kyphoplasty of T10. She was started on zoledronic acid, four milligrams monthly, and uh, uh, the Mayo Clinic Scottsdale favorite re regimen, Cyborg D. So her back pain resolved immediately following kypho. After four cycles of the initial therapy, her IgG had dropped by about two-thirds to 1170. Similarly, her paraprotein dropped by about 75%. Her urinary paraprotein went down more than 90%, and she normalized her creatinine, her hemoglobin in the upper 11s. Uh, she was continued on therapy, but her IgG slightly rose to 1,500, her M protein to 0 0.79, and her paraprotein just slightly, and no real changes in her creatinine or hemoglobin or symptoms. So at this point, this is case review, you should start, number one, start lenalidomide and oral steroids, stop the Cybor D, repeat her labs, continue the present regimen, or start another bortezomib containing combinations. And remember, there are no wrong answers. So some of you have, most of you have actually picked number one. Uh, I would pick number three. And I certainly would tell you it is an often common phenomenon in our clinic that slight changes in laboratories are figment of the imagination of the clinical lab and not, in fact, an indication to change therapy. And we certainly, uh, there could be a lot of debate about this, but I always say to my patients, if you don't like your labs, repeat them. You'll like them better a second time. That's often the case. Okay. Can we move back to the presentation? So the labs were repeated. In fact, the IgG continued to go up, 1,800. The M protein now nearly doubled. The M protein had risen as well. And she began to get more azotemic and uh, anemic. So what next? So well, what next really depends on a number of factors. And those involve disease-related, kidney function, which is deteriorating, bone disease, which she was asymptomatic now, but her marrow was showing more anemia. And subjectively, you want to know how the patient's feeling. Are they running the marathon, which Ken, my daughter's goading me into doing in March. Believe it or not, Ken likes to run marathons. And then what is the rate of progression? Is the M protein doubling every few months, or is it slowly rising? The role of cytogenetics, really, you could question at the time of relapse in terms of telling us what to do. Now, prior therapies, what kind of response did our patient have? It was pretty short-lived. How did the patient tolerate it? I didn't really go into detail on that, but that's going to be important in terms of our patients staying on that treatment, and certainly uh, that's the key to them responding to the treatment. And then in the upper right, how active is your patient? And mobility here in LA traffic doesn't only mean the ability to run the marathon. It means the ability to get from the east side of town to west side in LA. That can be a daunting task. So obviously oral agents may be more convenient. The potential for neuropathy is very important. My wife likes to play the piano. She obviously doesn't want that side effect. And on the bottom right, what comorbid comorbidities does the patient harbor? Are they diabetic? May steroids be an issue? Cardiac. Many of our patients are elderly, have heart issues. So anthracyclines may be an issue. Neuropathy. Diabetics often have diabetic neuropathy. So obviously, drugs like thalidomide may be problematic. So what about more detailed principles of treating a relapsed refractory patient? Again, make sure the patient really has progressed. Those of you who've looked at protein electrophoretic uh, tracings, you'll note that many of these numbers are very subjective. They're not as objective as you would think. 
Now, once you've confirmed the relapse, you obviously want to try drugs the patient hasn't seen before. But in CAPS, I have however. Progression on one drug in combination does not mean that that drug will not be effective with another agent. Examples, certainly we have lots of them today, but bortezomib failures with melphalan often respond to pegylated formulation doxel with bortezomib. But even different drugs in the same class may be active. So bortezomib melphalan failures may respond to other alkylators, cyclophosphamide. I'll show you data from our own trial with bendamustine. And it turns out lenalidomide failures often respond to thal, and now we know POM. I'll show you some data on that. And what's most startling, I'll show you data from bortezomib multi-drug combination failures, simply replacing bortezomib with carfilzomib. Most patients will respond, in fact, more deeply. Also remember that if patients progress from a drug at a lower dose, for example, we see this with lenalidomide in our clinic, if you bump the dose, they often respond. And remember, as we heard from Ken, the same combination may work again if the patient hasn't seen it for a while. Not something we do too often in clinic, however. So we know that bortezomib and pegylated formulation liposomal doxorubicin versus bortezomib from the Orlowski study has shown a marked difference in time to progression, but no difference in response. However, bortezomib, when used in this combination, certainly has a fairly high risk of neuropathy, and the PLD, as you know, often associated with hand-foot syndrome. So we first preclinically and then clinically went to a different formulation or schedule of this drug. We gave the PLD, as you see on bortezomib days, as well as IV dex. And the response rate was very high, but more importantly, the tolerability of these drugs at this lower dose, longer cycle at four rather than three weeks, and metronomic PLD resulted in marked reductions in both peripheral neuropathy of about 25%, and this was in the IV days, and hand, foot, and only 8%. So again, making these drugs with different schedules and dosing can have profound effects on their tolerability and therefore your ability to stay on them. Now, I mentioned bendamustine and bortezomib, and I'll show you some data also on that drug uh, with lenalidomide from a study done from Dr. Lynch, who's here and spoke a little earlier. This is a study we did. It was a phase 1-2 bendamustine rather than day one and two, like in lymphoma and CLL, was given on the first two days of bortezomib in an escalation, escalating 50, 70 to 90. You'll note the bortezomib is one, not 1 1.3. We didn't have any DLTs, and the good news, at the 90 milligram dose with one uh, bortezomib, we considered MTD, and we had responses in about half of these patients, but even better news, many alkylator failures with bortezomib responded endurably to this combination. Again, suggesting that even drugs in the same class, you can have responses simply by using another drug in that class. Now, as you know, well know, lenalidomide dexamethasone has been approved based on two large international trials in the relapse refractory setting, with tripling of response rates in both the US and Canadian, as well as the international trial, but in the bottom, importantly, both overall survival and time to progression superiority. Uh, bortezomib, as you know, not only has been used with Revlimid and Dex in the frontline setting, but Dana-Farber has also used it in the relapse refractory setting with high response rates in the upper left, about 80%, at least minimal responses. Uh, we as well have used this triplet with a fourth drug, again, PLD. So we've done our, if you will, DVD with Revlimid or lenalidomide, and you'll note that the dose of the len here is just 10, but in the bottom, Besides the high response rate, similarly observed by the Dana-Farber group, we didn't see any hand foot at all with this metronomic doxal dosing, and our peripheral neuropathy rates are only 25%. Abendamustine, as I said, has been used with lenalidomide and dexamethasone by Dr. Lynch's group. Small, fairly small study, but a very impressive response rate using this, and I've certainly used this with very good activity in relapse refractory disease. It's important to mention that retreatment with IMIDS is often effective. This is pre-pomalidomide days. This is a study retrospective from the Mayo Clinic suggesting that many patients on retreatment with another IMID or even the same IMID well respond. So the next question is for patients who, like this one who failed Cyborg D, the treatment options include all of the following for that patient. 
PLD with bortezomib, with or without steroids, vendamustine and bortezomib, lenalidomide and steroids, RVD in this case, lenalidomide, steroids, and bortezomib, or lenalidomide with oral melphalan. Yes, most of you got the right answer, number five here. Lenalidomide with oral melphalan, I think, would not be a good choice. Okay, we're going to move on to case two now. Uh, this is really the same case that the patient continues. She's now on lenalidomide, 10 milligrams, 21 days, and then seven days off. And we like methylpregnisolone, not weekly dex. The same dose intensity, though, per month, 40 mg every other day. And after four months, her IgG has dropped by about 40%, her M protein by half, and her urinary paraprotein as well. After nine months, however, she has increasing back pain, fatigue, and the workup by MRI shows a new VCF now at T7. Her IgG has climbed quite a bit, as you see, M protein as well, paraprotein's rising in the urine. She's become markedly more anemic and azotemic. She again has another kyphoplasty with good pain relief. She's continued on her zoledronic acid monthly despite the new fracture. But else, what else could you do at this point? Could you add clarithromycin, increase the lenalidomide to 25, add bortezomib and or PLD, start the patient on carfilzomib, start the patient on pomalidomide with steroids, are all the above are reasonable options? Yes, I think all of these are reasonable options, and I think one thing that should be really clear here, there's not one way to treat relapse. There are many, many options, much different than when Ken and I started working in myeloma about 25 years ago. Okay. So we've already heard about several of these trials, so I'm not going to repeat them in any detail. Uh, this is the trial that, of course, led to FDA approval of the drug. It's a phase two study design, and the POM was given for four milligrams on the same as the lenalidomide schedule, 21 days on, seven days off. And the other arm had the permission to add the weekly DEX, as we do often with lenalidomide, 40 milligrams weekly. Oops, I think the slides are stuck. Oh, there we go. And you'll note uh, that responses were observed in the palm alone arm, and there certainly were more robust responses when the low-dose DEX was added in. Now, I would emphasize that these trials really underemphasize, in my view, the activity of all of these drugs, and you'll see why momentarily. So this is the trial that we heard several times, the Thermopolis trial that was just published in this week's Lancet Oncology, comparing the POM with low-dose weekly DEX to very high-dose DEX. Uh, as you see, that's a lot of DEX for elderly people. Four days on, four days off. It's like the good old bad days. And the trial did show, as you heard, a doubling of the progression-free survival as well as improvement in overall survival, as we've heard several times already today. Now, there's also been a trial looking at POM, bortezomib, and low-dose DEX. Uh, the MTD had not been reached. Uh, this uh, trial by Paul Richardson, we heard a little bit about, very encouraging trial in refractory patients to lenalidomide, 75% response rate, beginning to suggest that this drug, again, can overcome another drug similar, that is, len failures can respond to POM. In that regard, we have been conducting now a phase one, two trial, which we're well into phase two, combining POM, DEX, and a good, our friend, PLD. This was a phase one, two. Uh, phase one was any patient who was progressing. Phase two patients, importantly, had to be refractory to lenalidomide, although it could be in any combination. And although we marched up to four milligrams with POM in the phase one, when we went to phase two, we had a lot of neutropenia. So we backed off to three milligrams, which we now consider the MTD, with the IV DEX and PLD dosed exactly as before, but with no Velcade, just with the PLD and DEX. And uh, we've now, uh, as you see, enrolled now actually over 40 patients, and the uh, MR better rate is running about 60%. And again, these patients are refractory, importantly, to lenalidomide, beginning to suggest this drug can overcome resistance to lenalidomide. 
Now, carfilzomib, you've heard a lot about. Uh, I do think that the data from this trial that was recently published from Keith Stewart, I put a circle around the important points. The overall response rate and clinical benefit rates here are very impressive, and these are patients in the bottom half who are bortezomib naive. So uh, based on work that we had done and Ken's lab had done, showing that you could overcome resistance to one proteasome inhibitor with another. Our work was done with delanzomid. I know Ken had done work with several other proteasome inhibitors. We marched into this clinical trial. This was a non-traditional interpatient phase one, two that's now been completed. We enrolled patients who had progressed while on or within 12 weeks of failing a bortezomib combination regimen. And we simply replaced carfilzomib for the bortism, and it didn't matter what the other combining agent was, whether it was an alkylator, anthracycline, glucocorticoid steroid, or an imid compound. Uh, all of these were tested in the patients on the trial. We started at the usual 20, but over the first four cycles, we marched up to 45 milligrams. Unfortunately, DLT was counted as grade two or better, because when we started initiating this trial, we had no idea the safety of this drug with all these different types of agents. But importantly, we did not change the cycle length or dose of any other companion drug. The good news is nearly two-thirds of patients had clinical benefit here. Uh, and this, these are quite, I think, impressive numbers, simply switching one PI for another, which kind of corroborated the, the preclinical work that Ken's group and I have done. And I've certainly done this often in clinic over the last year or two since I began getting positive data in patients who were not eligible to, for the trial, poor renal function, those types of patients, and it's worked great. So I think you saw this question earlier. For patients failing both bortezomib and lenalidomide, there is very little likelihood that other imids or proteasome inhibitors will be effective. I think you'll get this one right, I hope. <laughs> Oh, I hope that was 100%. Anyway, just know that you can respond to another image if you fell one image, and the same true with PIs. Okay. So in terms of treating the relapsed refractory myeloma patient, first of all, you need to confirm they have really progressed. Again, these labs are rather subjective. Reagents can vary month to month. 24-hour urine collections are sometimes left in the elevator or left on the floor at the home of the patient, I can tell you. And some patients can be watched even though they're progressing. So those who are asymptomatic, the slowly rising paraproteins with no end organ damage, these types of patients, we watch some for one to two years before we intervene. The determinants of the type of therapy, we don't really have any data on cytogenetics or genetics today. Certainly, the pace of progression can be determined in our clinic, and the extent, of course, of end organ damage, particularly renal dysfunction, that we need to be aggressive with. Life and work style is certainly important to consider as well, and comorbidities as well. So in terms of treating the relapse refractory patient, I would tell you the old rules, everything's off on, on the table now. The old rules no longer apply. All the following are often effective. Escalating the doses of drugs, for example, lenalidomide, can often lead to durable responses. And probably the same is true with carfilzomib in our early experience. Adding an antibiotic, we often do this with chlorithromycin, led by the group right here, and Ruben mentioned some of the data. We find this can be effective as well. And I have many a patient who are failing steroids as maintenance or steroid and image, simply adding chlorithromycin led to long-term durable responses. And remembering, again, that resistance to a PI, a proteasome inhibitor, or an imid drug in a combination, if you substitute another agent, different classes, for example, a PLD for a cyclophosphamide failure, but even within the same class, bendamustine, bendamustine can often work for cyclophosphamide or melphalan failures in combination with a PI. And adding an imid drug to a PI failure or vice versa often will work in our patients. And last but not least, remember that resistance to one proteasome inhibitor does not mean that that other proteasome inhibitor may in fact be quite effective. 
And we're, by the way, we're starting a similar trial in the next few months with exasimid, similar to what we did with carfilzomib for carfilzomib or bortezomib failures. In imid failures, you can substitute another imid and you can get success. We've seen that with thalidomide and we're seeing that now with pomalidomide and we're starting a similar trial to the one with carfilzomib for bortezomib failures now with pomalidomide for lenalidomide failures in combination. And I think it says zero. Thank you very much. <laughs>